Welcome to the March 22nd, 2023 Committee of the Whole meeting of the Municipality of the County of Kings. It is 10 o'clock in the morning. I am Deputy Mayor Emily Lutz, uh, filling in today for Mayor Matart, who is um, off due to illness, unfortunately. So we're sending good wishes uh, to our mayor this morning. Um, we'll begin this morning by taking roll call, and then I'll come to you, Council Meisner. So if all councillors could indicate their presence, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Council. We have all councillors present with the exception of Mayor Matart. <coughs> Councillor Meisner? Yes, I just want to ask to be excused at 11 o'clock. I have a specialist appointment for my daughter, so I will have to leave a few minutes. Well, I'll have to leave at 11 today. Um, so I just want to ask to be excused Absolutely. at the top of the meeting, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next item, item two, approval of the agenda. Could I have a motion to approve the agenda? Moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Meisner. Discussion on the motion. Additions, deletions, questions? Seeing none, all in favor of the agenda as presented, please signify in the usual fashion. Uh, Councillor Granger, how do you vote? <laughs> in favor of the agenda this morning? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, next, I'll look for a motion to excuse Mayor Matart from the meeting. Moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Hurdle. A discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor or otherwise signify now. Motion carried. Any conflict of interest issues that uh, require disclosure this morning from members of council? Seeing none, we'll move to item four, financial services. Um, for the benefit of the public, I'll give a brief preamble as our mayor is prone to do since he's not here, I can sort of do it. Um, the way we generally structure our budget meetings and presentations is that we have a committee of the whole for capital, a committee of the whole for operating and each of those are for staff to present all of the information for council to ask questions but no decisions other than to receive the presentations are made at these meetings so we don't debate at our presentations we are asking questions of clarification and then council has um, a period of time before our next budget meetings to absorb the massive amount of information that will come at us today and then to uh, enter into debate at the, the next subsequent meeting. So um, just for the public clarification and for as a reminder to council that we're here to receive a lot of information today, um, good luck. And um, with that, we will invite Mike Livingston up for a capital update and any additional questions. So this is building off the first capital presentation we had. Councillor Windsor, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. And um, I had a question uh, which I had uh, alluded to or referred to, uh, but uh, I, I don't think staff was totally clear on whether or not they had the full answer. But one was with respect to the uh, traffic study between Wolfville and New Mines to Greenwich, tra staff, uh, Greenwich uh, traffic study, and. My question that I want to ask is, I, I, I'm not seeing that specifically in the budget, and so uh, I would uh, like to know if the CAO or Mr. Quinn would have an answer as to how we anticipate funding that. I would have loved to have seen it specifically addressed in the capital budget, but uh, maybe they have another uh, game plan as to how we would accomplish any work that we're going to agree with with the highways group. Our CAO has a response. Um, thank you, Deputy. Uh, Mr. Quinn may want to tag on afterwards, but uh, my understanding is a council package yesterday there was correspondence from the minister, and there was a meeting between um, Public Works staff and uh, Mr. Quinn. I wasn't able to attend that particular meeting. I was off on that particular day. 
Um, so there's still back and forth on the scope and the amount of funding, um, but we anticipate that there will be a partnership arrangement come out for that study, and I would anticipate that we could uh, accommodate that through our outs what we call our outside engineering GL line. Thank you. Would you agree with that? Because we haven't rehearsed anything here, Mr. Quinn. <laughs> Mr. Quinn has his light on. No, I think you read my mind from last week when we discussed the matter as well. But uh, to your point, uh, we've sort of, I'd say, at a staff level, sort of have a number in mind, but it has to go back up to relative powers of B on both sides to finalize them with a cost-sharing cost agreement. But as indicated, my, my thought was outside engineering could capture our portion of, the, uh, of that study cost. Councillor? Thank you, and uh, I had a further question. And um, this is with respect to uh, the new mine secondary planning strategy. Uh, as you know, we have forwarded that to the minister for approval. Uh, and we've also, I think we're all aware that there's a, a, a further subsequent uh, planning work that, uh, that we can anticipate out of that um, with, uh, with um, uh, infrastructure, road alignment, um, the, the, the kind of uh, a little more detailed planning that would, I believe, allow us to take advantage of, of uh, what seems to be a swell of infrastructure program dollars that's available at the uh, provincial and the federal level right now. And I think a lot of the uh, things that can be achieved south of 101 will mesh fully with, uh, with some of the priorities of those uh, senior governments, such as uh, providing housing, such as uh, for the, um, for the um, um, prime uh, premier of Nova Scotia, doubling the population, et cetera, as well as the needs that we see uh, right air on the ground. Uh, so I, I am not seeing a particular planning money in there for those things and again um, this is the time where we're putting our budget together and a budget is an anticipation uh, we have more certainty with some projects than others but it is an anticipation of the work that we see on the horizon and so I would like to see money in the budget for this or again perhaps uh, there's an answer I, I don't think we want to see it uh, sit in abeyance for a prolonged period because we have not uh, done our follow-up budgeting here. And so maybe uh, the CAO or Mr. Quinn can respond to that. Uh, so I do us. have, Mr. Quinn has his light on, but this is, we haven't <laughs> started the meeting yet. And I just wanna make sure we ask these questions at the appropriate, like these might've been better suited during other business after we've heard from staff this morning. Um, I will allow it, but I just, I'll let Mr. Quinn respond because he's got his light on, but we, I'd like to start the presentations and then maybe some of these answers will be revealed in our staff's presentations. I'm sorry, maybe I'm misunderstanding. You wanted uh, to know whether there was uh, extra questions or questions? No, on I'll, the I'll go to Mr. Quinn. Hold on. Right. We'll go to Mr. Quinn, see yeah, if he has a response. You, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor, through you to Councillor Windsor. I think we're, there is a line item for asset management planning, which would cover some of this initial planning, but I think again, it comes back to these are assets that are owned, the water and sewer in particular are assets that are owned by the village. So they need to, at some point, they need to take the lead in terms of going after federal. We can certainly assist through and hopefully with the asset management planning exercise that's already in the budget and to encourage them along in those in those efforts, because yes, I think fundamentally, yes, they should be looking to the future to do some of these plans, but at the end of the day, they're the ones that are the utility owners for those particular items, and they'll have to be the front runner or, or the uh, project champion for those, and particularly going for federal funding is similar to the ICAP application last, last year, is that we certainly provide a number of in-kind hours in terms of helping prepare those applications, but ultimately those had to be submitted by the bills themselves as the asset owner. Thank you for your response, Mr. Quinn. Uh, Mr. Windsor, I'm not gonna come back to you at this point. Um, we're gonna go to our staff presentations and then there will be an opportunity to ask questions when Mr. Livingston's finished presenting. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to hold it just because this isn't on the agenda. We have staff ready to present. So 
we will come back to you. There will be lots of time to ask questions today. I just want to follow the agenda. Thank you. Mr. Livingston, you're here to present. Go ahead. Terrific, thanks. Um, so I should be fairly brief and then we can get into the, the additional questions on the capital budget, but some, some quick update items regarding the capital budget presentation and the material that was provided. Um, in that time between preparation of that material and release to council, there was a small change in the operating budget that sort of trickled through to the capital budget. Quite small, the, the key area of impact is just the amount uh, of the enhanced contribution to capital reserves has declined slightly. The, the amount is, I, I wouldn't necessarily consider it material, but you'll notice that there is a slight difference if you were to look at the, the capital reserve table um, in the material when it comes available for um, deliberations. So just wanted to highlight that, some very minor tweaks to that budget document. Um, so it, it's not uh, a confusion to you. Uh, and then, yeah, beyond that, the, the one of the other primary purposes of uh, this portion of the agenda was just to acknowledge that, uh, you know, the lead time of review of that document was maybe not as long as we had hoped for. So give you guys, uh, give council a little bit extra chance to review that document and, and bring forward any additional questions that may have come up in that time. Um, so we can, we can look to that now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Livingston. Councillor Windsor, did you want to ask your follow-up? Well, yeah, thank you. I, I, I'm, I know that in the, um, the notion of planning and, and that asset management in the village, that there's a line, and I don't know if we have ever tried to define that line precisely, but my view on this is that we're still in the planning stage and planning is not one of those responsibilities that was given to the villages. Uh, I believe that we have a strong to uh, we have a strong leadership role. Yes, we work hand in hand with them, and I believe that what we've done and what uh, what uh, Mr. Quinn referred to was an appropriate uh, uh, process there. But if we were to leave our villages to say that we well, are responsible for the plan, we do the municipal planning strategy, and uh, I don't think we would have had too much happen in our villages without all that planning that we uh, are responsible for, not only responsible for, but we, those villages pay a tax for. In fact, the same tax rate applies in the village of New Minas as generally. Uh, so I, I, I would ask that, um, that we consider this as part of our mandate, working hand in hand with the village, uh, the villages, which we are, uh, we've got lots of projects all over that are doing that. So um, um, otherwise we need to find a way to offload our planning to the village and give them the tax dollar to do it. Thanks, are you finished with your comments, Councillor? Uh, Just a reminder, this and is I would, uh, I would like the CAO to respond to that. I, I'm not trying to make an issue. I just know that we go further than a municipal planning strategy in doing our planning duty here. And uh, so me, uh, today, I'm just trying to exercise my stewardship here, fiscal stewardship to not only my constituents, but the county generally, uh, I don't have a greater stewardship responsibility than in setting up the budget, helping that, putting my input, and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not, yeah, Absolutely, I'm just trying to yeah, and not questioning, way. Not questioning your motives, just also, just a reminder, we have another mo meeting to discuss the capital budget, which there'll be debate, and you'll have the opportunity to make motions and all that type of thing. So, um, CIO, would you like to respond, or? We can leave it for another day. Thank you, Deputy. I think probably what we would like to do is, is come back to that. Um, we can do a little bit more preparation. I would, I would comment that um, in terms of the road infrastructure, I mean, it's primarily owned by the province. And we have, um, the councillor had actually organized the meeting. We had a very good meeting with Nova Scotia Public Works. And we have provided them all of the um, 
um, engineering work that was done as part of the secondary plan so that they can consider that as part of their five-year planning cycle. Um, I think uh, Director Quinn has adequately addressed the fact that the villages or that particular village owns its water and sewer. Um, and the fact that we're as recent as last week uh, back and forth with uh, staff to staff at the village about uh, undertaking this asset management plan. So I think the combination of those things will, uh, will you know, as the, as the councillor is indicating, we need to proceed with planning. So I think that'll address the planning aspect of that infrastructure uh, um, process. Yeah. Thanks for your response. Councillor Armstrong. Um, just a quick question to what Mr. Livingston just said um, about changes in the capital budget, the reserve amounts. Um, does that mean that the documents that we have here are outdated or, or incorrect? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so there is a slight change. It's quite minor, um, okay. so I, I wouldn't expect that it would influence decision making necessarily. But yeah, a minor tweak in, in, in particular in that capital budget. Could you budget. send us something just to? I'll, I point will that out? get the the pages. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor, for that clarification. Um, anything further? Questions for Mr. Livingston on the capital budget presentation, and I appreciate. Mr. Livingston, your acknowledgement of the timelines that council are under to absorb an exorbitant amount of information. So appreciate that acknowledgement. <laughs> <laughs> Anything further from council on the Capitol? Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation this morning, Mr. Livingston. Um, we'll move to We'll receive the presentations as one motion um, when we're finished with this one. So I'll look to um, Mr. Barr to begin the presentation on the operating budget. Go ahead. Oh, and Trish, did you? Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Barr. Great. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Good morning, Council. Uh, in acknowledgement of those lead times, um, there will be a similar type session at the start of deliberations next week for further questions related to the operating budget. We'll give that extra time as well to be able to, to, to do that. So I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit in relation to, uh, obviously we're presenting our 2023-24 operating budget and utility budget, um, and Katrina Roos is going to be doing the majority of the presentation. I'm up here to kind of speak a little bit towards uh, the start about uh, the assessment lift because that obviously has a big impact on our budget for this year. So I'm going to speak to that for a few minutes before Katrina continues with the rest of the presentation. So the outline here, of, uh, the start of our presentation kind of outlines everything we're going to go through in terms of the details of the operating budget um, and then Ms. Lesore, Regional SOAR, the Greenwood Water Utility and Operating Reserves. So for my part of it, um, I wanted to just speak a little bit around uh, assessment lift because, you know, it is a major component of the of the budgeting process this year. Uh, there's been significant growth in the consumer price index um, and obviously strength in the local housing market that's impacted the assessment lift of this year and we've, we've seen it uh, grow uh, more significantly than, than in the past. Um, however, uh, on the other side of that, uh, municipal operations certainly aren't immune to the changing economy that's occurring now and, and the impact um, that some of these uh, fiscal realities have on the municipality. Um, and there's offsetting cost pressures associated with it. So I wanted to spend some time kind of talking about that and kind of, a, I guess, a plan related to it. We've spent a, a lot of time here at the staff level uh, looking at different recommendations we'd be able to bring to both budget and finance and, and to council. Um, and certainly we're, we're trying to prioritize the municipality's ongoing uh, financial sustainability in, in making those recommendations. So just to have a, a good look at uh, from the assessment side of it. So overall, we mentioned that at a previous meeting that the, the growth in residential and commercial assessment is, is impacting our budget to the tune of, of about $4.8 million. Um, so with that, you know, we recognize that there's a lot of cost of living increases that are impacting residents of the municipality. Um, and we've got ratepayer support um, in that. So when you look at our, our budget this year, the personal property tax exemption program is going up from $410 to $510 uh, with an incre increased income threshold going from 42,000 to 45,000. So we've budgeted uh, more in that category to kind of help um, from that side of it from a, a property tax relief perspective. 
And then we kind of wanted to kind of assess the, the picture of where the municipality is at um, currently. So one thing is that, you know, looking obviously at um, residential tax rates, the, the residential tax rates, and you'll see it further in the presentation for operations. Um, and this part, I'm just kind of giving kind of a, a state at this point, is, is really competitive with a lot of other municipal units. Um, and when you look at the, uh, it's, it's one of the most affordable rates uh, across the province when you look at rural municipalities. Um, we dig a little bit deeper in terms of what's referred to as residential tax effort. Um, and that's uh, a calculation that's put forward in the financial condition indicators by the province. It's really looking at the, the revenue from uh, residential taxes per dwelling uh, divided by median household income. Um, for the uh, municipality county kings, the residential tax effort is 1.9%. Um, when you compare that to a provincial average of about 2.1% and a provincial threshold that's set up of anything below 4% being low risk, um, there's a, a, quite a, a, a gap between where the municipality's tax effort of 1.9 is relative to the, uh, the threshold for medium risk. Um, Mr. Barr, could you explain yeah. the residential tax effort again? Sure. Because I found your helpful at budget and finance, your exp explanation of budget and finance. Very yeah, helpful. absolutely. It's it's a calculation that's basically looking at what the the revenue is for uh, a, a per dwelling, um, residential tax revenue that would come in for per dwelling divided by the median household income. So it's a factor to kind of see how affordable property taxes may be in someone's overall income level. Um, when you look at say HRM their residential tax effort, I think for the last year that's reported on is 3.8%. So theirs is quite a bit higher than what you would see in the municipality of County Kings. Um, we're at 1.9%, so literally half of, of what it is in, in HRM. Um, the province looks at anything that's below 4% is still being low risk relative to their FCIs. Um, four to six being moderate, anything over six being high. Um, so quite a ways away in terms of that uh, that capacity of what they would consider to be a, a risk in terms of the, the impact and the burden on, on residents. So just one factor, and, and before I get into some of the details of what we consider, just want to give kind of that, that state, I guess, of the, of the municipality. So when we talk about, uh, you know, by the numbers, I guess, um, the impact on the uh, assessment lift for this year, 7.7% uh, was an increase in the cap upper limits. That would be the maximum in which a, a cap could um, be adjusted. It's really based on the October, over October uh, CPI increase. So that cap was set by PVSC as 7.7% and that affects uh, you know, the residents that are under the cap program. There is a, a significant amount of uh, additional growth within the municipality that's impacting the assessment lift related to property sales, new construction, major renovation projects, that type of stuff, um, accounting for almost 5% of additional uh, assessment growth. So overall, just kind of looking at it, um, again, before I get into kind of the meat of, of discussing the lift is kind of the, the current state, is you know we did look at what PVSC produced in terms of information. We looked at uh, trending that they have. Um, and home prices, as everyone knows from following the media and, and other information that you have access to, um, have been getting to fall from their kind of peak that we saw in, in highs in 2022, 20, uh, early 2022. Um, and in 2023, 2024, we think that, you know, looking at that trending, if it continues, is probably the peak of the assessment growth that um, residents would see looking at that trending information. Mm -hmm. Certainly, as, as we know from, from COVID times, um, no crystal ball, but um, trying to look at trending, uh, they certainly produce some good information on that. On the commercial side of things, we're looking at, uh, in 23-24, assessment growth of about 9.1%. Um, so that's up significantly as well and contributing to that overall lift that we're seeing this year. Um, that's compared to it being relatively flat the last five years. Uh, when you look at the last five years for commercial, I think it's averaging less than 1%. It's, I think it's like 0.9%. So very flat from that side of things for the commercial side of it. But then just to give some context before I get into the, the rest of this stuff around assessment lift is on a commercial side of things, uh, greater than 50% of our commercial tax revenue is made up by really you know 5% um, of the largest employers in the municipality. So what does that mean, like I said, by the numbers? Just to give context, when you're looking at any kind of adjustments up or down from a residential rate and a commercial rate perspective, um, on the residential rate, you know, one cent on 
The tax rate impacts overall municipal revenues by over $415,000, um, but on an individual level, that, that same reduction that drops uh, revenue or increases revenue by that amount um, translates to about an $18 uh, adjustment on the average tax bill, annual tax bill. And on the commercial side of things, what I mentioned before about in terms of the, the large employers, um, obviously any kind of commercial rates up or down um, most significantly impact those, those larger commercial enterprises. So kind of moving forward, and, and like I said before, Katrina gets into the detail of, this, of the presentation. Um, we are recommending, you'll see it in the, in the budget document, to hold the tax rate in 23-24. And it's really related to um, kind of six major areas. I'm gonna to touch on them all in a little more detail. Um, some of them more than others. Um, so the, the really six areas that kind of drove our recommendation at a, at, at a staff level are the inflationary pressures um, that we're obviously seeing on general municipal expenditures, um, mandatory cost ex increases. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, but it's um, as assessment growth increases, our, our mandatory expenses increase significantly as well. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Service exchange, um, we're anticipating that future service exchange will likely have significant uh, annual operating cost impact on the municipality. Um, capital, uh, so future capital, so certainly the landscape associated with capital is changing. Um, when you look into some other areas that have to be incorporated, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Um, staff resources that are really needed to, to meet the growth um, that we're experiencing in, in permitting um, and our ongoing operating service requirements. And then one major area is, is looking at our capital reserves and stability in that. So I'll speak to that probably more than the others as we kind of move through this. So the first one I mentioned was inflationary pressures. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on this just simply because it's not unknown to everyone, the impact that's there. And it certainly is, uh, from a municipality point of view, something that we experience. Um, and when you're looking at the estimates that we made back in our budget documents last year in 22-23, um, nearly all the expenditure categories in 23-24 have been, have been surpassed, what we consider to be a, a conservative estimate at that time. Um, and obviously it goes without saying that that diminishes municipal buying power. So inflationary pressure certainly on, on all of our general expenditures has been a, a key component of our recommendations today. The mandatory cost increase, so uh, those relate to things such as uh, ABRCE, like uh, education expenses, um, RCMP, other major areas, housing. Um, a lot of those expenditures are tied to um, uniform assessment calculations. Uh, and there's a lag associated with uniform assessment. They'll look at the, uh, the assessment in the previous year and, and that'll reflect in your subsequent year's uniform assessment. Um, we're already seeing right now in 23-24 the impact of uh, UA growth um, from previous assessments. So for this year, by example, we're looking at almost a million dollars uh, increase in our expenditure associated with education, our contributions that we have to make to the province um, from the previous year. You know, other mandatory expenses that aren't related to, um, aren't related to UA, but still are related to the mandatory expenses like RCMP, we're anticipating increases of close to $800,000 in those areas. So. Um, a little bit separate from inflationary, but uh, certainly a huge, big cost impacts for the municipality. We're anticipating that to grow even more in the next year. I talked about the, the lag associated with uniform assessment. The, Im the impact of the assessment growth that we're seeing this year is going to be reflective in future budget years. Uh, so we have to keep a close eye on, on where those go will go and what kind of impact it'll have. The third item out of six is uh, service exchange. So. As you know, um, renegotiation of uh, what you know is being referred to as a memorandum of understanding between the province and municipalities um, is something that uh, was stated uh, explicitly in the Premier's mandate letter to the Min Minister of Municipal Affairs. Um, so we know that that renegotiation um, is both um, starting to commence and, and will be ongoing for a bit. Um, but when you look at that, it has a significant uh, potential for uh, exchange of programs between the province and the municipalities. Um, so when you look back to what happened back in 94 and 95, um, something similar could happen with this renegotiation that we're talking, talking about. Um, obviously the, the impact of the municipality is unknown at this point, um, but when you look at also in that same mandate letter, there is uh, explicitly talking about um, local roads being a part of the uh, MOU renegotiations. 
Um, and as you know from past discussions, uh, Kings County has uh, about 135 kilometers of J-class roads, um, a disproportionate amount relative to its, uh, its peers within the municipality, where some rural municipalities have none or, or very few. Um, so there is a, a, a real possibility that there could be a disproportionate uh, number of those roads allocated to the municipality if, if that is part of the renegotiation. So all of that to say that, you know, there's, there's potential significant cost impacts to the municipality and we have to be mindful of those uncertainties. Uh, future capital. So your capital budget that you would have saw is uh, about $80 million in projects over the next five years. Um, so some significant undertakings uh, are outlined in that. Um, and with that, there's a number of areas uh, as you look at the capital budget that are really routinely becoming more and more part of uh, capital planning. So areas related to accessible accessibility, um, climate change mitigation and adaptation, um, and projects that support population growth and housing are all huge considerations that are reflected both in the, the budget that's here now and in the five over the next five years, um, but we anticipate we'll have bigger impact. From a, a large scale perspective, obviously we've got a number of alternative energy programs that we're looking at. Um, you can see one in the capital budget that is uh, explicitly cost out from the uh, assessment or the uh, feasibility study uh, that was undertaken by our experts related to the Metaview um, solar farm um, is a significant project. Um, there'd be something similar obviously with the wind side of it when we get to that point. Um, we've also, you know, there's been media releases and council decisions around furthering the studies around the, the recreation complex. So some significant capital projects upcoming um, for the municipality, hopefully over the next few years. Uh, the fifth item that's uh, impacted in here that we wanted to mention is that um, from a staff resource pr point of view. So uh, there's been presentations to council on this in the past and there's increased demands on the human resources that are needed uh, to provide, you know, the, the standard statutory compliance type stuff, but with the development um, related services as well, uh, certainly has an impact on it. And when you look at what I talked about in terms of the non-CAP assessment increases related to the construction activity, that's, that's having a big impact. Uh, on top of that, obviously human resource complement is needed to be expanded to kind of continue some of the implementation of some of the municipal plans that have been put in place. You know, I'm talking about strategy for belonging, AT plan, accessibility plan, things of that nature. Um, and to really help operationalize uh, the strategic priorities of the Municipal Council. Um, so there'll be more information about this contained within the, the presentation from Katrina and, and certainly it's something that um, has presented to, been presented to Council in the past. The last item and, and probably the most robust uh, to talk about relative to our recommendation this year has to do with our, our capital reserve um, st stability. So as you're as you'll know, like in the past, back in November of 2021, um, Mike Livingston and Scott Quinn made a presentation to council in relation to our uh, reserve funds related to our municipal sewer, our wastewater infrastructure. Um, and from that, there was recommendations to council to how to address that short shortfall, um, to put a plan in place to really address that shortfall um, and wrap policy around it. Um, so the efforts in relation to that reserve have been well documented and um, kind of show I think success in terms of having a lens towards uh, capital cost replacement and, and how to best tackle that. So what we're doing now is that we're, we've been undertaking a similar process to look at our capital reserves overall for the municipality. Um, and there's a lot of work to complete on that. But in the short term, you know, we assess kind of, I guess, the impairment of the state of our capital reserves at this point relative to even our, our current policy. So our current policy has um, a couple different levels uh, and a minimal, uh, a recommended and optimal type level uh, around reserve management. Um, the recommended level talks about how an amount equivalent to accumulated depreciation charge for capital assets for asset replacement plus any uh, funding for specific pro projects or new infrastructure be considered in establishing the capital reserve. Um, so when you look at just that factor in terms of accumulated depreciation, as of the end of fiscal 21-22, our capital reserve balance was uh, south of $7 million, $6.85 million. Um, and our estimations would be that the capital reserve should have been closer to uh, 13.7 as of the end of 22-23. Um, so that, that represents a, a significant shortfall. Um, and our contributions that we've been making to the capital reserve 
um, have been in alignment with policy um, that we are contributing based on that recommended amount um, of the of the balance of the uh, accumulated amount. But there's a couple of issues with that. One, that always hasn't been the case with the municipality. Um, that minimum contribution level of 10% of depreciation is something that has certainly um, been done in the past, um, not in the last number of years, but in the past. Um, and then, you know, something that has a, a, an also a, probably an equivalent type impact is the utilization of those reserve funds. So when you look at uh, having an accumulated depreciation uh, reserve target associated with it, but when you're undertaking um, replacement costs, replacement and utilizing those reserve funds using present day costs, it in a lot of cases exceeds the historical costs associated with it. And it creates a, a wider gap between um, where your reserve targets need to be and, and what you've got actually got accumulated in there based on just accumulated depreciation. So that's contributed to kind of that shortfall that we're seeing now um, that, uh, you know, seven, that has seven million dollar type of of shortfall associated with it. So what we're proposing as part of, of this budget and the steps moving forward is that there really is a, a two-step process um, to kind of help bridge that gap towards ensuring ongoing fiscal responsibility as it relates to our reserves and, uh, and um, um, putting us in the best position moving forward for both current and, and future ratepayers. So the first step is we see it is that um, immediate steps need to happen to really attain the reserve policy's recommended balances. So again, that's the accumulated depreciation and recommended balance. Um, we think it'll take multiple years associated with that, you know, that, that deficiency that's there now. Um, but the first step is let's start trying to bridge that gap as it relates to where our reserves are and where we need them to be. Um, a second step is really to kind of take a look at um, policy revisions that we would need to do to kind of make that optimal um, reserve target really be the recommended reserve target. Um, as you know, and I, we've got an example here to kind of talk about, is that um, replacement assets now probably more than ever are significantly greater than what historical costs are. So we need to stop the, the bleeding as it relates to the way that we utilize those assets. So whether there's changes in policy in terms of exactly how we utilize that reserve fund or the contributions that we make to it, policy revisions need to be considered for that. So I mentioned this, I kind of touched on it, but the current reserve balance that we have um, representing about 56% of the accumulation, accumulated depreciation really understates the scale of the existing reserve deficit issue. And just by way of example, we've got a really small one here that kind of quantifies, because it's difficult sometimes when you're looking at large asset bases. Um, I know with budget and finance, we talked a little bit about, you know, the, the linear assets, you know, the pipes in the ground and things of that nature. When you look at the, the, the sheer volume in terms of the, the costs associated with it, it's hard to get your head around exactly, okay, what does that mean from a replacement point of view overall from the large scale assets? So by way of example, one that we ran into this year from our budgeting is just looking at simply vehicles. Um, so back in 23, 2014, um, there was uh, some vehicles that were purchased, replaced at a cost of about $20,000. So as per our policy, um, putting money away for that $20,000 over the life of that asset. So it usually has about a 10 year useful life. Um, we're looking in this current year's budget to replace those assets. When we go to, to the reserve balances that we have there, accumulated depreciation, we've only put about $20,000 away in each of those vehicles. Obviously the replacement cost of those is much greater and we're looking um, at hybrid vehicles now, but even without that would be, would be much, much more. Um, the replacement cost that we have in the current budget is about $60,000 per vehicle. So you can see from that one example, just by contributing to the reserve based on the accumulated depreciation amount, we're looking at about a $40,000 um, unfunded replacement cost that has to be dealt with. And so our opinion is that, you know, look at, uh, we talked about it a bit of budget and finances that, you know, the, the way of the world in financial planning now is to um, not defer those, those costs to future rate payers. Um, whether you're talking about things like CPP or other large scale programs, um, the best way is that the tax base between 2013, 14 and 2023, 20, 24 should have been responsible for the costs of of uh, those replacement vehicles. That's the service period related to them. They should be planning for the replacement of that. However, based on our reserve policy, what we have here is that we've got that underfunded um, replacement costs. And really what that happens is that it, it, those costs fall to current ratepayers, whether you're looking at um, 
tax revenues from the current year, or future rate payers if you're looking at uh, financing those and, and incurring debt associated with it. So right now with uh, the current fiscal capacity of the municipality um, and really in the time where we're seeing extraordinary inflationary cost pressure, uh, we feel the time has come to, to really address the, the reserve deficit and uh, get the municipality on, you know, we're on good footing as it relates to our reserve management. Um, we could be on a, a lot better footing. So I mentioned before that um, if we, we don't take action on it, it really just continues to kind of grow the problem, um, excuse me, and continue with the uh, kind of the current reserve contribution that we have now and, and the way that we utilize it only puts really a significant tax pressure on future ratepayers. Um, excuse me. Um, so inaction at this point kind of um, really just kind of punts the problem to, to future ratepayers associated with the, the municipality. So to kind of wrap things up, you know, our plan that we're recommending as part of our budget today is uh, really a multi-year approach to addressing the current reserve deficit relative to accumulation, uh, uh, accumulated depreciation targets, and then really taking steps towards uh, making recommendations around policy changes uh, and changes to our reserve management practices to ensure that there's sound financial and asset management practices. Um, the contributions to those assets, to those uh, reserves, really reflect uh, replacement costs and um, reflect the assets uh, service periods. We're taking steps in this budget to really kind of eliminate, you know, what we're kind of referred to like an unfunded liability, and that's that's what it is. It's a, a growing problem that is is going to have a significant material impact. Without me sounding like uh, the sky's falling scenario, but based on the kind of costs that we're looking at from current replacement side of things, there's a significant unfunded liability that's there uh, facing future ratepayers in the municipality, um, and we feel that the the budget that we're presenting you today with the recommendations that we have it help ensure that rate, uh, tax rate stability for current and, and future residents. So with that kind of concludes my part around the assessment lift. Um, there's a lot of detail to be presented to you and, um, related to our general budget. I'm certainly open for questions around the assessment lift side of it or later once you hear the full presentation, I'd be open to that as well. Um, are there any questions at this point for Greg now that we've heard the tip of the iceberg? Councillor Kellum? Uh, I don't have a question, but I wish Mr. Barr had been around between 1988 and 94 <laughs> and explained this out in the way he has. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. We're extraordinarily lucky. Hind Hindsight's 2020, yes. Sorry, I set your mic off too early. Um, okay. Thank you, Mr. Barr. I think we'll invite Ms. Roofs up to the microphone. Welcome to Committee of the Whole. Thank you. And you may want to pull that mic down a tiny bit. There you I go. Will. Is that better? Yep. I can. Perfect. So the 23-24 proposed budget, oops. The 23-24 proposed budget consists of $59.8 million, which is a 10.6% increase over the 22-23 approved budget. In the following presentation, we'll provide details of this budget um, through each aspect of it. So we're going to start with an overview of some of the key variances that you'll see without the throughout the budget, starting with property tax revenue. So as Director Barr has touched on, there has been significant assessment lift this year, which is resulting in an 11.6% increase in overall property tax revenue. We're also seeing an increase in property tax in lieu payments. So these are property tax payments from other levels of government for the properties within the county owned by those. And we're seeing an 11.4% increase in that revenue stream. The next revenue stream is interest on investment in taxes. So this is the interest held on our bank deposits and it has had significant growth. Um, interest earned on bank accounts is tied directly to the Bank of Canada overnight target rate. Um, and the Bank of Canada has implemented seven rate increases totaling 4.25 basis points during the 22-23 fiscal year. So the budget currently being presented assumes that the current rate will now remain constant throughout the 23-24 fiscal year. Interest on overdue accounts is anticipa anticipated to remain consistent with prior years. So interest earned on overdue tax accounts is, is anticipated to be at historic levels. 
the main driver here is the interest earned on the bank accounts. Next, we have our area rates. They're rising 10.4%. Um, area rate revenue sort of comes in and then goes directly back out. Um, the municipality collects area rates for a variety of organizations for things such as fire capital, private road maintenance, and village rates. Um, these revenues are also being impacted by assessment lift, as well as some additional organizations requesting collection services. Trina, to get a little closer to the mic oh, or to uh, speak a little louder, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's challenging to hear. Thank you. Sorry about that. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Our next section is transfers from other funds, as detailed in a chart on page 44 of the agenda. So key variances here relate to the prior year having funding in relation to the Hansport Fire Department. You'll remember we had one-time funding of just over a million dollars. Um, so you'll see there is a decrease this year in transfers from other funds, and it's primarily made up from that transfer. Next, we have our education amount, um, which is rising 7.2%. Again, this budget is based on the uniform assessment data and preliminary enrollment information provided by AVRCE, and the increase is in relation to UA growth. RCMP and, pro RCMP and prosecution services are seeing a 9% increase. Um, no information was available at the time of budget release from the RCMP, so we have used an estimate based on historic data and current CPI rates. Next, we have salaries and benefits, which have a 17.2% increase. The current budget has added 12 additional full-time equivalent positions, and also included in the budget are approved non-union rate increases and unionized increases per the collective agreement, as well as an allowance for vacant positions and the municipality is currently engaged in a salaries and benefit review, the results of which are not yet finalized. However, a $250,000 allowance has been included within the HR department as an allowance for possible adjustments to salaries and benefits based on anticipated recommendations from the report. In pages 109 to 113 of your agenda package, detail um, all of the staff additions and changes and requirements. Next, we have material supplies and utilities, which are increasing 17.1%. Variances are detailed in individual departmental sections, and primary drivers include rising vehicle costs, insurance, utility, and supplies. Next, we have special projects, which have a 32.1% increase a breakdown of project funding is on page 74 and will be discussed further in this presentation. Next, we have fire protection funding. So this is looking like it's decreasing 26%, but again, last year we had the one-time $1 million Hansport um, contribution to their fire station. So when you normalize that out, we actually have a 4.3% increase to operating funding to the departments and that's outlined on page 98 to 99, and we will discuss that further in the presentation. And then finally, debt service and transfer to reserves, you'll see is rising by 86.8%. The proposed budget includes additional contributions to capital reserves beyond the policy prescribed contribution. A portion of the increased contribution relates to replenishing capital reserve contributions that were previously diverted by the COVID-19 reserve, which we'll discuss later in the presentation. And additionally, an additional $1.385 million of assessment lift has been directed to enhance capital reserve balances as an initial step to bring them in line with the policy recommended balances and to support longer term asset management objectives. The additional amount for debt service relates primarily to the debt on the Engineering and Public Works Operations Center. That was a big slide. <laughs> It'll be shorter after this. So we'll now move into a more detailed look at each section of the budget, starting with the budgeted revenue sections, which can be found starting on page 40 of the agenda. The municipality has six revenue areas, 
within general operations, and the most significant source of revenue is property tax, which comprises 77.6 per total budget. So property tax revenue includes funds collected from residential, commercial, resource, and assessed properties, farm acreage, and special tax arrangements. You can see for the 23-24 budget, we're projecting just over $46 million of property tax revenue, which is an 11.6% increase over prior year's budget, and represents 77.6% of the total budget. Next, we have payments in lieu of taxes, which are funds collected on provincially and federally owned and assessed properties in the municipality. The budget is based on existing properties and assessment levels, and you'll see the 23-24 budget increasing due primarily to change in assessment and collection rates on the federal property. So we've had some assessment rate increases there. Next, we have interest revenue, which discussed previously has increased significantly. Um, it's more than doubled from what it was last year. And again, that's tied directly to the Bank of Canada rising rates as well as the current balances in our banks. Our next section is departmental revenues, which are generated through sales of services and services provided to other governments, as well as grant funding. A combination of historic averages and known inputs are used to, de to develop these budgets. And further details on departmental revenues are included on the individual department pages within the agenda, pages 65 to 111. But some examples of the key items here include increased municipal sewer revenue due to increasing rates, as well as connections as well as increased building permit revenues, which have increased due to high level volume and demand. The next section of our presentation will focus on property tax trends and rates. Um, this section begins on page 44 of the agenda package and will cover some of the items highlighted by Director Barr earlier in the presentation. So our first figure, figure 10 on page 45, demonstrates revenue for each class of property over five years. All increases relate to assessment growth only. So as the chart demonstrates, over the past five years, residential revenue has grown 28.8%, of which 12.5% of growth is attributable to the 23-24 fiscal year. Commercial has seen 12.5% growth over that time and resource has seen 26.6% of the time growth. So as you can see, um, revenue growth has been rising and has had a significant rise in the current year. Next, we have uniform assessment. So uniform assessment is the municipality's total taxable property assessment, plus the value of funds received through special property tax arrangements. And UA is a driving factor for several cost-sharing arrangements, such as the education, corrections, things like that. Grants and mandatory provincial expenses. So this figure compares the historical change in UA for the municipality of the County of Kings, rural municipalities, and the province as a whole. As you'll see, the municipality had strong UA growth of 7.4% for the 23-24 fiscal year. And again, UA is typically tied to the prior year's assessment lift, so it would be anticipated that next year we would see an even larger increase in uniform assessment. Figure 12 on page 47 of the agenda distinguishes assessment growth between the cap portion and the remaining growth from property tax sales, new construction and major renovations. The majority of homeowners, close to 81% within the municipality, experienced an assessment increase resulting from the CAP program, which for 23-24, tied to CPI of October for Nova Scotia, was set at 7.7%, which you can see from the chart is one of the higher figures over the past few years that the municipality has seen. 
And then again, additional growth relates to property sales, new construction, and major renovations, which resulted in total assessment growth of 12.6% for the 23-24 year. Over the past six years, properties under the cap have seen an average cap increase of less than 2%. So you can see that this year's impact has been significant. Home prices have seen a significant increase as well from 2020 through 2022, and this has driven a significant portion of the assessment lift. However, this chart from the Canadian Real Estate Association shows that average residential sales prices for Nova Scotia seem to have peaked. Um, prices have begun to fall from the 2022 highs, and the assessment growth seen in 23-24 may also be the peak. Um, continued assessment growth is expected but the municipality believes it is unlikely to remain at the recently observed levels. As of January 2023, residential sales by volume in the Annapolis Valley had fallen 16.7% over prior year. Figure 15 on page 50 of the agenda, agenda demonstrates the five-year history of the commercial assessment growth. So now we'll look at the commercial side of things. For fiscal 23-24, commercial assessments within the municipality have increased by 9.1%, which as you can see, is clearly the most significant increase the municipality has seen in many years. So now we'll flip over and we'll look at some of the property tax rates, starting with residential and resource. The 23-24 proposed operating budget maintains the residential property tax rate at 0.853 per $100 of assessed value, and the residential rate for Kings is 13.7% or 13.7 cents below the provincial average for other rural municipalities, which is currently at 99 cents per $100. Um, so as you can see, we're clearly well below um, some of the other municipalities that would be comparable. The residential rate of 0.853, however, is a base rate, so properties located in various areas of the municipality would also be subject to specific area rates, such as fire capital, village rates. So this figure, um, figure 17, compares tax rates, including area rates, for properties in various areas of the municipality and compares those to the three local towns. So as you can see, this takes our base rate and um, a comparable rate for each of the villages and compares that to the current rates for each of the towns. Um, and as you can see in all areas, residents within the municipality are paying slightly below what you would see in the towns. Next, we'll flip over to some residential tax effort. Um, Director Barb went through this in his introduction. However, residential tax effort is the average property tax burden per household in the municipality. So it's sort of the percent of household income that would be directed towards paying property tax. The calculation takes the total residential property tax, including the sewer rate, divided by the number of dwelling units and the medium income for the county. The province considers residential tax effort below 4% as a threshold for low risk. Kings is currently at 1.9%, which is below the rural average of 2.1 and well within the provincial threshold. So the residential tax effort sort of demonstrates the um, ability for residents to, to afford their property tax burden. We'll now look at commercial rates. The 23-24 proposed operating budget again maintains the commercial property tax rate at 2.287 per $100 of assessed value. The municipality's commercial tax rate is 18.3 cents above the provincial average of $2.21004 of assessed value for rural municipalities based on the 22-23 approved rates. But we also examined how rates within Kings compared to the three local towns, factoring in village and fire rates, and all areas of Kings are below the rates of all three of the local towns. So comparing to the local area, we are competitive. And it should also be noted again, due to the high composition of the municipality's commercial tax base, five accounts currently generate more than 50% of the municipality's tax revenue, 
Therefore, rate adjustments would most significantly impact larger commercial enterprises. Our next section of the presentation will focus on operating expenditures. So gross expenditures provided for in the 23-24 proposed operating budget total close to $59.8 million, representing a 10.6% increase over prior year. This chart, which can also be seen on page 57 of the agenda, shows how each dollar collected in the general fund would be distributed. As we can see, the larger expenses include education at 23.5% and RCMP at 15.7%. In total, the proposed operating budget includes $59.8 million of expenditures, and the next slides will break down various departments and groups of expenditures. The first group of expenditures we'll look at is our mandatory payments, which are detailed on page 58 of the agenda. Mandatory payments are items which the municipality has no discretion over and form the single largest group of expenditures within the budget. Details on each item are outlined in the budget document and some notab noticeable changes include the education amount increasing by 7.2%, the RCMP increasing by 9%, and our regional housing, which represents funds paid to Housing Nova Scotia for the municipality's share of net operating losses, is seeing a 24.4% increase. Um, again, we had not received an estimate for this amount, so we had used historical data, as well as indexing prior year's upper end of their estimate by CPI to get our budget figure. So this is still subject to change, but it's the best estimate at this time. So again, mandatory payments are showing an overall 7.5% increase and represent 44.2% of our total operating budget. We next have our intermunicipal service agreements um, at just over $6.6 .6 million. Uh, there's a 5.9% increase over prior year budget. Um, these contributions to IMSA corporations account for 11.1% of the proposed budget. And I'm just gonna go over some of the higher ones. So the municipality's contribution to Valley Waste Resource Management has increased 0.9% in 2324 to just over $4.8 million, excluding a one-time $369,600 equipment reserve contribution that is conditional upon approval of a related policy. Key budget influences include rising cost of major contracts, fuel price escalations, insurance and salary increases, and full details on the operating capital budget were presented to Committee of the Whole on February 21st, 2023, and will be updated prior to budget approval. Uh, the municipality's operating contribution to King's Transit has also increased 19.5% in 2324 to 975,406. Again, this is just the contribution to operations. Um, they also had capital contributions totaling $210,000, which includes the $48,000 of routine annual capital and $162,000 of special capital related to potential electrification of the King's Transit fleet. Um, the budget was presented on February 21st, 2023 in full detail and will be updated prior to budget approval. The FCFNA budgeted contribution is based on historic actuals and the Valley Run budget is based on submissions to date. The REMO budget has been based on discussions with the REMO coordinator and their annual budget submission, which has not seen any significant changes. Our next section can be seen starting on page 65 of the agenda. Legislative expenses include counselor, remuneration, travel, meals, committee honorarium, scholarships, and other legislative services. At just over $677,000, there's a 9% increase over prior year budget. 
salaries and benefits are budgeted to increase based on policy finance 05002, council and committee remuneration. And for the 23-24 fiscal year, council stipends will increase by 7.6% over 22-23. And the budget for benefits has been adjusted to reflect current levels of benefit participation, leading to a net increase of 6.6%. Material supplies and utilities include committee costs such as citizen honorarium and meeting costs, membership dues, council travel and conference costs, telephone and office supplies. Budgeted amounts reflect actual usage and include an increase to councillor travel budget um, to reflect the return to in-person conferences and increased travel costs. We'll now move on to the administrative department, which covers the office of the CAO and the deputy CAO. This department is detailed starting on page 68 of the agenda package, and the department has a total tax levy requirement of just over $3.6 million, uh, which consists of activity revenues, which include revenue generated from recreation programs, such as aquatics, day camp, seniors programming, as well as rental income related to um, some various properties within the municipality for cell phone towers, things like that. Grants relate to funding for received for um, other levels of government for recreation programming and summer student positions. And the budget reflects anticipated available funds in relation to planned programming. Transfers from reserves includes carry forward funds for consulting and studies required for ongoing projects and reserve transfers are fully detailed when the, within the operating reserve section of this document on page 138 to 142, and we will detail that throughout the slides later on. Salaries and benefits for the department are increasing by 21.3% over prior year, and this change primarily relates to the addition of 4.5 full-time equivalent positions within the department. Um, also included in the budget are approved non-union rate increases and unionized increases per the collective agreement, as well as an allowance for vacant positions. And included within HR salaries expense are the annual adjustments to the non-vested sick leave accrual in the employee vacation banks. Within the recreation budget, programming salaries have increased by $26,400 related to enhanced kayak and paddling programs and updates to active school programming. The municipality is also currently engaged in a salary and benefit review, the results of which are not yet to be finalized, and $250,000 has been included within the HR department as an allowance for possible adjustments to salaries based on anticipated recommendations from this report. Materials and supplies include funds directed for travel, telephone, public engagement initiatives, office supplies, recreation programming, and costs related to occupational health and safety. Accounts are reviewed annually and adjusted to be in line with actual spending, as well as planned projects for the upcoming year. Uh, purchase services, you'll see there, um, increasing 17.6%, includes consulting, insurance, legal fees and training for all staff, as well as recruitment fees, document storage, advertising, and some recreational program costs such as facility rentals. Adjustments have been made to these other accounts to bring budgeted amounts in line with actual spending. And included in this budget for 23-24 is some planned consulting work for climate change. Um, tentatively includes a greenhouse gas inventory and carbon impact engagement. Also included here is planned consulting work around recreation, which will include a comprehensive review on how recreation services are delivered within and by the municipality, as well as some additional funds for public engagement for district meetings and other events throughout the year. Special projects are budget, budgeted that support the municipality's strategic priorities. You can see they're budgeted at just over $1.3 million. 
Um, the capital and project section provided full details on these projects and the table on the following slide will summarize the required funding from operations for these projects. So as you can see, special projects budgeted to support the municipality's strategic priorities as well as other goals. Um, these projects were included in the capital and project budget. This chart is demonstrating the amount of funding coming out of operations and operating reserves for these projects. So this primarily relates to consulting and study work for the projects, but in total, $1.375 million is budgeted to come from operations to support these projects. Do you mind taking a question at this point? Oh yes, certainly. Perfect. Councilor Winther. Just, uh, just uh, a question. Is that special project chart in this package? I might not have uh, seen it. Uh, yes, Councilor Windsor. It should be on page, I believe, seventy-two of the package. It's within okay. the administrative department. Yeah. Uh, yeah okay. Is it it's, on seventy-seven? Uh, yeah. I'm just trying to follow along. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Seventy. Seventy-seven. Seventy-seven. Oh, mine are out of order. That's why I can't find it. <laughs> uh, thanks, Councillor. Thank you. And our next department is Finance and IT. And these details can be seen starting on page 80 of the agenda package. The department has a net tax levy requirement of just over $3.6 million. And it should be noticed that the enhanced capital reserve transfer of $1.385 million has been grouped here for simplicity. Um, and with these normalized out, the department is seeing a 21.4% increase in operating requirements instead of the 94.7% that you see on the screen. So if you take out the enhanced capital reserve transfers, the actual department is seeing a 21.4% increase. So activity revenue includes commissions, commissions charged for the collection of area rates. Um, the current rate is 4% per policy finance 05007. Also included are administrative fees generated through the provision of payroll and IT services to other organizations. Other revenue include things like listing recovery fees, tax sale administrative fees, and tax sale expense recovery, um, and are reflective of actual and historic amounts. Salaries and benefits you'll see are increasing 8% over prior year. And this change primarily relates to the addition of a data analyst in the IT department. Materials, supplies, and utilities include things like telephone, postage, supplies, equipment, and software supplies, hardware supplies, and toner for the printers. And budgets reflect actual usage. Purchase services include tax sale expenses, primarily legal costs, external audit fees, equipment contracts, and IT consulting, licensing, and maintenance contracts. The increase in this section primarily relates to the IT department, where an additional amount has been budgeted for rising fees and additional fees for new required software licenses. So we have seen a bit of a rise in software licenses over the past year, so we're budgeting to reflect the actual need for the costs. Um, professional services and audit fees have increased in line with contractual requirements. And then the increase to debt and transfers to reserve relates primarily to the information technology capital reserve. The budget included the replacement of funds previously diverted to the COVID-19 reserve, as well as reserve funding in relation to the new broadband assets. Additionally, a $42,000 repayment to the operating reserve in relation to the construction of the new Hansport Volunteer Fire Station has been included here with the additional 1.385 contribution to capital reserves also grouped in this area. So that's why the area seems to be such a significant increase. We've included the full 1.385 under finance for simplicity and to keep it together. Next is engineering and public works. Um, detailed in the department and budget can be seen on pages 88 to 98 of the agenda package. The department has a net tax levy requirement of $3.1 million, which consists of, so activity revenue comprises municipal sewer fees, streetlight area rates, 
revenue from a power purchase agreement relating to the municipal complex solar panels, as well as administrative fees charged to our other utilities and service areas. The increase relates to increasing sewer revenue and increased administrative fees charged to the utilities in relation to support services provided by the municipality. The 23-24 increase is also related to shared costs for the new operations center. So within engineering, we collect administrative fees from the utilities for some of the support services such as finance, managerial overview, things like that. And that has been impacted this year by the need to share the costs of the new operations center, so debt service, things like that. Uh, transfers from reserve relate to the annual payment of a Government of Canada municipal owned lease to house a civilian air park at 14 Wing Greenwood and also $95,000 of special project carry forward. Salaries and benefits have a 12.4% increase in budget and this relates to the addition of four new full time equivalent um, positions as well as budgeted um, non-union rate increases and unionized increases. Materials and purchase services have been broken down in charts within the budget document. And the most significant increase in materials relates to increased municipal sewer costs, specifically around administrative support costs, and purchase services has changes related to engineering consulting fees and J-class roads. So within the engineering section of the budget, you'll see charts that detail the materials and supplies as well as purchase services, just to provide a little bit more detail where the figures are a bit bigger than in other departments. Transfers to reserve and debt service have increased 31.8%. And this is accounted for updated debt servicing, including debt related to the engineering operations center, and also included our contributions to capital reserves. Within the engineering department budget, you'll see different budgets for the building, municipal sewer, road transport, and those are detailed within the project budgets. Um, also detailed within the engineering section are costs related to street lights. So an annual fee is charged for properties located within 100 feet of a service street light area. The fee is set on a cost, rec cost recovery basis and used only to fund those costs directly related to providing the lighting. A, signi a significant number of properties were added to the service, service streetlight area in 2023 through new construction and also some GIS work that was done in-house. This combined with no rate increases from Nova Scotia Power allows for a decrease in the general streetlight fee. Um, the charge for street lighting with Centerville Growth Center will remain at the current level. So you'll see the general rate is falling from 42.5 to $35, and it is anticipated that um, that should be able to be maintained, whereas the centerfold rate is being held at $4 to cover the lights in those areas. So our next section focuses on emergency management and fire protection which can be seen on page 100 to 102 of the agenda package. Grant revenue here includes funds received from the province for civic addressing. And fiscal 22-23 again included the one-time funding from the General Operating Reserve in relation to the contribution to the New Hampshire Volunteer Fire Department. So you'll see last year had just over the million dollars of transfers from other funds. This year that's not included because it was a one-time transfer. Salaries include a per percentage of the director of EPW's salary who has emergency management responsibilities um, and also an emergency management coordinator position has been added in the 23-24 year. Um, the final departmental allocation of this position is subject to change, however, for budgeting purposes, it has been included here. And then purchase services which have just over a 1.4% increase, include fire dispatch costs, generator and dry hydrant funding, and fire service metals and emergency funding. We'll move on to fire department funding on its own separate chart. 
The municipality funds 13 fire departments and operational funding is provided through the general tax rate, while capital funding is provided through area rates. The Fire Services Advisory Committee is a standing committee of council that provides advice on fire services. Municipal Council considered recommendations from the FSAC and approved a maximum increase of 7.7% to operating contributions for those departments not under contract for the 23-24 fiscal year. Council has also directed the Chief Administrative Officer to bring forth proposals for consistent honorariums for volunteer firefighters as part of a new fire funding policy. The budgets for 23-24 are based on submitted budgets from the fire departments keeping in mind the maximum threshold of 7.7% as approved by council. Councillor Windsor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering, uh, we are adding a PY, an EMO position I'm just wondering, uh, and through you, Madam Chair, to whichever technical officer uh, is best informed on it, uh, an EMO position, we uh, right now um, um, have this service through a, a regional EMO that's hosted in Wolfville. Uh, what is the context for this position, uh, and is there some overlap or is it uh, is it uh, going to be complementary or are we pulling away um, or uh, I, I know we've talked about fire services a lot but I, I just like to get a little clearer uh, definition of what a, a position here would do in the context of the larger picture of EMO and what we anticipate doing in a narrower sense I guess. Mr. CAO, would you like to answer that one? Thank you, Deputy. Yes, so we do, uh, the councillor is correct, we do participate in an intermunicipal service agreement with uh, the other units in Kings County uh, for, on a regional perspective. So that's for the regional uh, delivery. We also have, um, at present time, we have staff internally that are dedicated to the municipalities' plans and resources. And uh, this room, for example, in the last couple of years has been activated as an emergency command center on a couple of occasions with the weather conditions changing. So the, I think the primary thought is that we need um, a little bit more dedicated resource for our municipal that may not cross other municipal boundaries, emergency responses and plans, and also how we plug into things like running the emergency uh, planning center when it's activated. Thank you. Thank you, and I know that we have a manager that, um, that takes on a lot of responsibilities. So will that, uh, will that uh, help with that position as well? Or will it, will it take on those responsibilities? Or will that manager um, still have management oversight and the position would be there? So presently, the responsibilities that I'm describing fall under the Director of Engineering and, uh, or EPW use the acronym, uh, so it would okay. go more to the new position, so there'd be more dedicated focus on it. Okay, yeah, I was thinking about Terry Brown and his involvement in the fire department as well. Yeah, we're, this one here is, um, I believe we're talking about, uh, you characterize it as emergency management. What page are we on and I can, emergency services coordinator. Yeah, so that would be, you're, you're correct, that would be part of that, but, uh, um, the, the other emphasis is on liaison with fire departments and whatnot, so you are correct in policy development that council and we've discussed with council. Thank you. Yep. So a dual role, you're correct. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. I'll turn you back on there, Ms. Ruffs. There you go. Thank you. Our next section is land use planning and development, um, and it can be viewed on page 103 through 111 of the agenda package. The total net budget for this section is $728,000, and it consists of activity revenue, which includes de development application fees, 
Salaries and wages um, include approved non-union rate increases and unionized increases per the collective agreement, as well as an allowance for vacant positions. Um, no new full-time equivalent um, people have been added to this department. Materials and utilities include telephone and supplies, and budgets are adjusted to reflect annual anticipated costs. And purchase services include the lake monitoring program, as well as meeting costs, and budgets have been adjusted to reflect actual anticipated costs for the upcoming year. Our final section is inspection and enforcement, um, which is included in the agenda package directly after the planning section. And it has a net budget of $904,000, consisting of activity revenue, which comprises building permit revenue, as well as amounts received from other municipal units for providing inspection services, village contributions to the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee, and dog tag revenue are also included here, along with any fees for other licenses. The increase relates primarily to building permit activity, and fees related to providing inspection services to other municipalities. Salaries and wages reflect the addition of two full-time equivalent positions to assistant building inspectors to increase inspection capacity to meet the growing demand. Materials and utilities include telephone, travel, and office supplies. And again, this budget has been adjusted to reflect actual and anticipated actual costs. Purchase services relates primarily to an animal control contract with an external service provider and costs of the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, the budget has been adjusted to reflect anticipated actual cost with no significant changes. Next, we'll move into a staffing summary, and this can be viewed starting on page 112 of the agenda package. Um, Within that section of the package, it does detail a description for each of the 12 proposed full-time equivalent positions. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but if anybody has any questions, please let us know. Um, the municipality's 23-24 proposed budget includes 96.5 full-time equivalent positions, and this does include the 12 new full-time equivalents um, allocated among the divisions as shown on this chart. Uh, 12 new full-time equivalents have been included um, where needs have been identified within each department for additional staffing to fulfill service delivery responsibilities as well as to operationalize the strategic priorities of municipal council and respond to some unprecedented development growth and related resource demands. The staffing section also summarizes the planned summer students for this upcoming year. Our final area of focus within the operating budget itself is our grant programs. These are detailed starting on page 117 of the agenda package. And in total, $2.7 million is being budgeted, which is a 3.6% increase over prior year. Details on each funding stream are outlined on page 117 to 121 of the agenda package. Um, there's not a significant amount of change from prior years, um, and I won't be detailing each funding stream today, but if anybody has any further questions on grant programs, please let us know. And again, the primary drivers here are the um, increase in the um, property tax exemption programs. Multi-year projections have, so next we're gonna move into sort of a looking forward, a five-year projection over the next five years for the operating fund of the municipality. So multi-year projections have shown, and this is available, um, I think it's on page 122 of the agenda package. I know it's pretty small up on the screen there, but. 126 of the agenda package, Thank 123 you. of the budget book. Thank you. So multi-year projections have shown that there may be the ability to provide additional service enhancements in projects to meet council strategic priorities. Ass assessment growth, specifically residential, has been strong in the 23-24 year. And while it's not anticipated to continue at this level, it is anticipated to remain strong for the next few years. 
Um, numerous factors outside of the municipality's control will affect future budgets, including interest rates, annual assessment lift, inflation, mandatory payments, which continue to rise and make up close to half of the total budget. The municipality has little note to no discretion for the amount charged for some of these items and other pressures such as increasing insurance rates, utility rates, and rising fuel and supply costs will also continue to have an impact on future budgets. Um, within this section of the budget document, it does list out the assumptions that we've used in these projections. Um, so there's full details on how we've, how we've forecast out for the five years. That sort of concludes the operating budget itself for the general operations of the municipality. Um, we'll move on to the utilities now, starting with the municipal sewer budget. In this Are there any questions before we move on? Um, yes, Councilor Armstrong. I was just wondering if we might be able to take a quick, quick break before we move into the these particular ones. I think that's more than appropriate. We'll take a quick 10. Thank you, and Thank you. give Katrina a break too. She's working hard up there. All right, see you back here at 1140.
back. So we will reconvene. Perfect. All right. So we'll now move on to the discussion of utility budgets, starting with the municipal sewer on page 129 of the agenda package. Municipal sewer provides service to properties in 18 different communities throughout the municipality. And the municipal sewer is accounted for within a separate subset of accounts within the municipality's operating fund. So the budget that we just presented, the operating fund, would also have the municipal sewer within it, um, which is unique compared to the other utilities. Activity revenues are increasing by 10%, which factors in residential, commercial, and other sources of revenue. In addition to a rate escalation in line with Nova Scotia October CPI for all items, there are approximately 225 additional connections, as well as increases to sales of service agreements, which are directly tied to specific costs. So in total, activity revenue within the sewer is seeing a 10% increase. The transfers from sewer operating reserve of $95,000 relates to carryover funds for three projects, the SCADA system, the laboratory building assessment, and municipal specifications manual update, and these projects are included under the administration line of expenses. Salaries and benefits are projected to increase primarily due to the addition of one treatment plant operator. And the maintenance and vehicle budgets represent the best estimate of annual requirements and activity levels based on a review of historic spending and planned upcoming maintenance projects. Lift station and treatment plant decreases represent adjustments to fees paid to other municipal units for services. And these are partially offset by rising facility power costs, which factor in an 8.3% rate increase in line with Nova Scotia power. Administration costs are increasing due to rising insurance costs, satellite surveying costs, and increase to general supplies. Um, also included here are administrative fees paid to the municipality, which are increasing in relation to the municipal sewer share of debt servicing and operating costs of the new EPW operations building. Transfers to capital reserves accounts for 30.4% of the budget and these funds are required to ensure capital funds will be available for future capital requirements. Unlike the municipality's general tax rates, the blended sewer rate is not tied to property assessment and therefore is not increased or decreased from changes in assessments. Therefore, the sewer rate needs to be adjusted annually to keep pace with annual operating costs and to ensure adequate capital reserve contributions are being made. As approved in policy finance 05003, the fees policy, the sewer charge indexes annually based on the prior year's October Nova Scotia CPI rate for all items, which for this year will be 7.7%. So currently the rate is rising from 530 for a single family or a single dwelling to 570 and a vacant lot will be at 171, a 7.7% increase. And um, we have a question from Councillor Windsor. Yeah, just want uh, some clear, uh, clarification here. I think I understand, but uh, on municipal sewer budget, when we put in our salaries and wages, but wages, salaries and benefits here um, that is to represent the portion of the county's salaries that's allocated to support the municipal sewer system uh, through you deputy mayor to councillor windsor the salaries and benefit line includes all of the workers who would directly support the utility so anybody who would post their time normally to um, like the treatment plan operators, the maintenance planners, things like that. Um, the more salary and benefits for stuff like finance staff who offer support, um, the directors who offer overall support would be captured within an administrative fee that is uh, paid between the utility and the general operating so fund. So there's, there's, are you saying there's no allocation of uh, those that are not directly um, uh, working 
for the municipal sewer system? Yeah, so the salaries and benefit line represents all of the staff working directly for the municipal sewer directly. system. After allocations to Greenwood Water, and regional sewer are factored in. And then the salaries and benefits that are less direct are factored into an administrative charge paid by the utility to the municipality. Well, the administration charge that's further down the yes. list there? Okay. Yes, so that would capture salaries right. and benefits okay. for, for the staff and, not directly working. And the debt servicing, is that that's part of the new yeah. building, is that right? Yes, for you. So the debt yeah. servicing for the new building is yeah. captured within general operations. Yeah. Yeah. However, a portion of that, based on utilization of the building, is also captured in the administrative fee. Yeah, okay, and I asked that question, I think it's very relevant because we've had, uh, we had a lot of discussion in the regional sewer and trying to convince our partners of, uh, of uh, the legitimacy of our budget that allocated a portion to the regional sewer. So if we can demonstrate that we're doing the same thing to ourselves, to our, our users of the system, then I think it puts us on good ground in our, and we have a technical uh, group looking at this matter. So, you know, if those philosophies align, then I think we would be on good ground. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Armstrong. Just, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just further to um, Councillor Windsor's question, in the engineering and public works budget, there's an allocation for salaries, wages, benefits, blah, blah, blah. Um, for $2.1 million. And then in municipal sewer, it's 1.3, and in regional sewer, it's 232,000. So would we, do those two smaller figures, are they included in the 2.1, or are they minus off the 2.1? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor to Councilor Armstrong. So the 2.1 within the EPW section of the budget would include the municipal sewer salaries. It would not include the regional sewer or the Greenwood Water Utility salaries. So, but it does include the municipal sewer salaries. Okay, so we would minus that off. Yes. Okay. Yes, they'd be included right. there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Thanks, Ms. Roofs. You may continue. All right. Next, we'll take a look at the regional sewer budget. Um, the regional sewer is our next area of focus, and it can be seen starting on page 134 of the agenda package. So the difference between the regional sewer and the municipal sewer as far as the accounting organization is that the regional sewer is its own um, operating fund and capital fund within the municipality, and that's why its budget is separate and outside of the operating budget of the municipality. So the regional sewer system consists of the treatment plant in New Minas and a trunk collection system extending from Colbrook to the New Minas Greenwich border and from parts of North Kempfel. The regional sewer system is a partnership among the municipality of the town of Kempfel, village of New Minas, and a private PepsiCo incorporated. The approved budget was presented to the regional sewer committee on February 16th, 2023, and was recommended to individual partners for approval Final approval and recommendation by the Committee to Municipal Council took place on March 15, 2023. Overall budget costs of the regional sewer system have increased by 6.4% from fiscal 22-23. Material supplies and utilities have a 9.3% increase related to monitoring and communication costs, maintenance and increased EPW operation center costs, and rising electricity rates. Budgets remain the best Budgets represent the best estimate of annual requirements and activity levels based on a review of historic, routine spending, and planned upcoming projects. So in total, the regional sewer has a budget of just over $1.7 million, which is a 6.4% increase over the prior year. And that is funded through the various partners. Um, this table details the funding sources of the regional sewer. So as you can see, King's portion is $262,000. And this amount would be expensed within the municipal sewer budget and therefore funded through the municipal sewer rate. Question from Councillor Windsor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor and Katrina. 
Well, my question here is that we have lumped together debt and reserve transfer spheres in the other uh, our municipal uh, uh, table. We have uh, separated them out. Debt servicing and transfers to reserves. Do you know what the those numbers are for the regional? I sewer? through you separately, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Windsor. I'm not directly involved with the regional sewer budget, and I'm not directly. Um, I don't know the exact breakdown of the six hundred and sixty-nine thousand um, dollars. We can we can provide a table in the yeah, final yeah. document if that would. And I think it's Add probably 30. good to, to have it right in the table. This being a um, a table that various partners uh, have an interest in. We'll make a note and update Thank that you. for the final document. Great, thanks. All right, no other questions. And our last utility is the Greenwood Water Utility, and these details begin on page 136 of the agenda package. The Greenwood Water Utility is a bit different from the other utilities in that it is a regulated utility under the Public Utilities Act. The utility's rates can only be changed through approval of the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. Activity revenue is projected to decrease due to lower consumption by one major commercial customer, and this is partially offset by projected growth from some new residential connections. Other revenue represents interest earned on the utility's bank balances, and the increase, again, relates to the rise in interest rates on our deposits. Salaries are budgeted to increase 11.8% from fiscal 22-23. Due to the increasing allocation of actual hours over the last three years, um, this allocation reflects actual time spent at the utility. So when the salary budget is completed, um, all of the municipal sewer salaries are then allocated out to the utilities. Greenwood Water Utility bases that on a three-year average of actual hours worked at the utility. So that percentage of direct sewer salaries is then allocated to Greenwood Water Utility. Material supplies and utilities include such items as power, chemicals, maintenance, and vehicle costs which are increasing due to rising fuel and power costs, increasing chemical costs, and additional required maintenance that has been seen. Purchase services include insurance, regulatory expenses, and water testing. Purchase services have a small increase due to the requirement for a full water system assessment. Um, Nova Scotia environment and climate change requires all public water supplies to conduct a system assessment every 10 years, and it is anticipated to have a cost of approximately $20,000. Um, so you can see that that is primarily driving the increase in purchase services. As well, funds for a rate study have also been budgeted. There is no projected change to the rates for the upcoming year. However, with the rising operational costs, decreased commercial revenue, and the level of capital budget being expended in upcoming years, and the resulting debt service, a rate study will be required, which may result in increases to current rates. And funds to, to, for a rate study have been included in this year's budget. Oh, sorry, I didn't notice a question. <laughs> I get so into these charts and trying to read the little numbers that I forget to look at the screen. Go ahead, Councillor. Um, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, is the Sandy Court water system included in this, even though it's not mentioned in any of this? Not one time is it mentioned here, but it does include the Sandy Court water system in Aylesford, correct? Um, my, through you, Deputy Mayor, to Councillor Armstrong, my understanding is that Sandy Court is part of the Greenwood Water Utility. Okay, thank you. Lots of nods, thank you. Go ahead with the reserves. All right, our final section today will focus on operating reserves. So I know this chart is very small, but um, at March 31st, 2022, we had reserve balances, operating reserve balances of $13.4 million. That's forecast to be 12 million at March 31st, 2023 this year, and then 10.2 million for March 31st, 2024. Um, balances have decreased. Um, due to budgeted project activity, such as the funding of the Hansport Fire Station, 
as well as special project funding and also the drawing down of the COVID-19 reserve. So total operating reserve balances are projected at just over $10 million for March 31st, 2024, and reserve transfers will be examined in detail on the next slide. Before I get into the transfers, I'm just going to talk briefly about the COVID-19 reserve. So the COVID-19 reserve history and use is detailed on pages um, throughout the agenda package, oh, sorry, on pages 22 to 23 of the agenda package, so more at the front of the document within the introduction. And there is currently a balance of $389,000 of uncommitted funds remaining. The reserve was created with two goals in mind, to fund community support initiatives and to protect the municipality's cash position during the pandemic. To date, cash flow supplements have not been required as the municipality has seen continued assessment growth and has not experienced declines in revenue collection. With pandemic related mandates being lifted and the uncertainties around revenue impacts from the pandemic being resolved, these funds are no longer required to provide ongoing direct supports. Therefore, it is being recommended that the reserve be closed and the remaining balance be utilized to partially replenish capital reserves for the previously diverted contributions, which totaled $711,000 when the reserve was created. Funds from general operations have also been allocated to replenish the remaining diverted funds. So the goal will be to use the remaining COVID-19 reserve balance as well as general operating funds to fully replenish the 711,000 that had been previously diverted. We have a question from Councilor Killam. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'm wondering, is there, was there any consideration on, uh, instead of transferring to capital reserve, to transfer that amount to uh, community grants and, and uh, help out the communities that have gone through a rough time beyond what we've already done. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. uh, through you, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Killip, um, it's not something that we directly that talked about, but perhaps Director Barr would have some, some information. Your light's on, Director Barr. All right. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, to Councillor Killam. Um, so in consideration of closing the fund and what to do with those funds, uh, we did consider the fact that the, there was a number of programs that have been in place over the last few years in terms of those purposes for for uh, support for community groups. Um, and at this time where uh, those programs have really been exhaustive, uh, the only consideration we really gave it as part of our recommendation was to uh, replenish back their capital reserve funds that have been, have been utilized to, to, in order to create that fund in the first place. Uh, thank you. I, I, I guess I'm still thinking that maybe that could, this could be done uh, if council wanted it to do, to happen. We could do that. And uh, I guess the only way I'll know if, if council's interested at all is to make a motion to that effect. Is that correct? Yeah, when we get to our deliberations meeting, which is uh, Oh yeah, the, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got another one coming. All yes. right, thank you. Yeah. Um, back to you, Ms. Roos. Okay. So this chart, which can be seen on page 143 of the agenda package, details all of the transfers coming out of the operating reserves for the 23-24 budget. Um, key transfers include $95,000 of sewer projects carried forward from 22-23, 369,600 from the Valley Waste Resource Management Reserve, um, Valley Waste Management is preparing an equipment reserve plan and, and related policies and has budgeted $500,000. Conditional on approval of these policies, the municipality's proportionate share of 369,600 will be funded from the special Valley Waste Operating Reserve Balance that was established on September 21st of 2021. Next, we have 488,000 $135 coming out for various special projects. Um, again, these projects were detailed previously in the presentation. And along with the $488,000 of carryover for special projects, we also have $505,000 coming from the COVID-19 reserve. This is previously approved and committed funding for the Municipal Infrastructure Development Strategy. 
The remaining 389,173 balance in the COVID-19 reserve is then proposed to be transferred to capital reserve as a return of funds previously diverted. And then transfers to operating reserves um, total. So that chart represents all of the money coming out of the operating reserve in the budget. And then we also have 521,290 going in. And this includes interest paid on specified accounts, transfers for future projects, such as the municipal election, open state based funding and developers contributions, as well as an interfund balance of excess funds. Okay, we have a question from Councillor Windsor. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I just want to be clear on this, um, my understanding on this chart. So the top, when we get to total transfers from operating reserves uh, to general operations, that's coming from the reserve to the operational budget to finance activities for this year? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, to Councillor Windsor, yes. So the total transfer is from operating reserves to general operations of just over $1.5 million would be reflected in the operating budget. And then we also have an interfund transfer between one operating reserve to another of $266,000 and then $389,000 transferring out but going to the capital reserve funds, so not going to operate. So is my interpretation right then that in addition to the assessment lift of just about five million we're also transferring this which is used in operations we're also transferring this as well to out with operations this year yes the 1.577 will transfer to operations for operating requirements thank you for that clarification. As designated through the chart Okay, thank you. No further questions? So to ensure continued financial sus sustainability, the planned activity with regard to operating reserves has been analyzed in detail to determine if it will keep the municipality on side of key financial indicators. Um, annually, the province compiles a financial report on each of the 49 municipalities and as part of that report, financial condition indicators are calculated and used to evaluate a municipality's financial health. One of the key indicators relates specifically to the balance held in operating reserves versus total operating expenditures, less mandatory transfers. A 20% threshold is the minimum for obtaining a low risk financial indicator. A high percentage indicates a higher balance in operating reserves which provides greater flexibility to address unexpected future events, and a low percentage below the 20% would indicate less flexibility to address unexpected events, which could put the municipality in financial difficulty. Um, operating reserves are also a cash management tool for multi-year projects or commitments, and having a sufficient balance allows for enhanced multi-year planning and provides flexibility to pursue opportunities as they arise. So balances have decreased from the March 31st, 2022 balance because again of budgeted project activity such as funding of the Hansport Fire Station, special project funding, and draws from the COVID-19 reserve. It is forecast that reserve balances will however remain above the provincial threshold at 20% and we're forecasting currently at 24.1%, so well above the minimum threshold um, before the province would consider a, a risky situation. Um, and then we also have, in addition to the provincial financial conditional index, um, for operating reserves, the municipality has its own reserve policy, which outlines specific thresholds by which the reserves should be evaluated. And as you can see by this chart, the 23-24 budget is exceeding the maximum recommendation thre recommended threshold as set out in that policy. Um, it has two benchmarks. Um, one is to evaluate all of the operating reserves against own source revenue. And then the other benchmark is to to evaluate only the general operating reserve, so that reserve that is not designated for specific items, again, against own source revenue. So both thresholds are at 10%, and as you can see, the budget um, 
still remains above the threshold set out in policy. So it's above the maximum recommended threshold. So this concludes the detailed presentation on the operating utility and reserve budget. Um, this budget, along with the capital budget, will be deliberated by Council on March 29th. And we have a session on April 5th, if required. Okay, are there any further questions for Katrina? She did just outline our next steps, so we do meet a week from today at 10 a.m. to discuss both capital and operating uh, at that time. And the intention is, of course, to make a motion to approve a budget of, at that time for those two things. More than two motions. There's multiple motions, but um, Councilor Armstrong, question. Um, just uh, some general ones. Um, the first thing that I would ask my colleagues is that if they send any questions to staff about, um, about the budgets um, outside of the council, if they could send it to everybody so that we know these questions have been asked and answered and we won't have to repeat them again when we get into deliberations. It, I think it might shorten things up a little bit. Um, my questions, I just got a couple. Uh, the expanded human resources complement um, I know that they've included um, salaries for those positions, but has there been any accommodation made for all of the other things that go along with adding extra people like space and computers and desks, and is that all built in along with those positions? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, to Councillor Armstrong, we have built in for things like office supplies, um, ID hardware, things like that, and also where required specifically for the building officials, we've added vehicles. Okay, great. Um, under legislative, um, which is, I guess, us, um, there's debt and transfer to reserves of 26,000. Is that strictly for our our computers and stuff like uh, that? Through you, I mean, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Armstrong. So um, there is a fixed amount, I believe it's $2,200, might be $2,600 per person within the municipality for IT replacement costs. Okay. So that is a transfer to the IT capital reserve. See, I already knew that one, but I figured I better ask just to be on the safe side. And uh, under the staff summary, which was on page 112 of, of the uh, virtual um, agenda package, um, we, you talk about new positions, but at, at this particular point, I think we're all aware that we have significant vacancies within um, the building right now. So in the different schedules that you've given us as far as salaries, are the vacancies in there as well as the um, new positions? So through you, Deputy Mayor, to Councillor Armstrong, we've enhanced the vacancy rate percentage. So we have a percentage that we apply to all salaries in all departments to allow for this, and we have enhanced that this year to, I believe, just over 3.5%. In addition, um, past practice has been to budget new positions at typically 10 months of fill. This year, with these positions, we have used 10 months for a few of them, but the majority were budgeting more for an August, September fill to allow time for the recruitment process. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Any further questions? Okay. Um, I would now look for a motion to receive the presentations this morning. Moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Armstrong. Discussion on the motion, which reads that Committee of the Whole received the presentations on capital budget updates and the proposed operating budget 2023-2024 as provided on March 22nd, 2023 for information. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion or debate on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor or otherwise, please signify in the usual fashion. Um, the motion carries with two councillors absent. Um, Councillor Meisner had indicated, of course, that she would be exiting, and which she did at around 11. Um, is there any other business to come before Committee of the Whole? Councillor Killam. Um, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Before I came to the meeting, I was listening to the news on CBC. And um, as you know, over the years, there's been efforts to harness the Bay of Fundy tides. And there was... Uh, a bit of excitement with the latest, but uh, this morning uh, they've turned away from it because of uh, running into 
red tape and also uh, I think uh, not a, not very much cooperation as far as positive cooperation with the uh, fisheries and oceans. And I'm wondering if there's any letter we could send to uh, try to support that uh, particular company that wants to continue, but they run into a lot of difficulty, or have someone look at it and see if there's anything we can do at the municipal or uh, maybe a UNSM level. To, but it's as far as the news item this morning is, it's it's dead in the water again, mm -hmm. and it was mainly because of um, problems within the, the system. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just wanted to at least acknowledge that and let it let it be known that. Uh, it, it would be nice if we could get a, a, a project going such as that, but I know it's beyond our scope, but mm -hmm. I, I just was disappointed to hear that, that's all. I do remember it did come in front of council at one point several years ago for rezoning, I think, or something to do with land use, and council was supportive at the time, And um, but if you want to leave that perhaps with the CAO and mayor when he's back about getting some more information and yeah I uh, I didn't I wasn't able to get all the information but the the gist of it was that it's dead yeah. in the water now after mm. a lot of money being spent it's unfortunate Thank yeah okay well we'll leave it uh, with staff and see if there's some further information um, was there any other business to come before committee of the whole I don't see any. We have no public joining us this morning, so that takes care of item six. Uh, next would be a motion to adjourn. Councilor Granger, Councilor Armstrong, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor or otherwise, please signify now. Uh, once again, thank you to our tremendous staff and the incredible amount of work they have put into these budgets, not just our finance staff, of course, but all staff who have to crunch the numbers and submit things and we really appreciate all the work and uh, look forward to making some decisions next week. Thank you everyone for your participation. Have a great day.